All right, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm extremely uh, happy uh, to be here and uh, very proud uh, to be part of this uh, important uh, conference. And um, I, come to, I, I come to you from uh, California, uh, actually the mountains above Santa Barbara. And before, uh, before uh, Jackie got a hold of me, I, I think I was going to Farrell. I usually don't look like this. I look like a Mexican version of... Uh, of uh, David Rodiger, I don't know. David <laughs> Rodiger in his grunge, uh, grunge look with the long hair and the flannel shirts and the mountain boots. Uh, but that's what I usually look like, as I said, I was going to Charlie before I got here. Uh, I want to talk about uh, uh, I want to talk about a project uh, that uh, essentially is a sequel to the, to this book that I finished uh, several years ago. I uh, labor rights are, are civil rights. And uh, I started thinking, actually I had an epiphany, uh, and I, I was thinking, well, what happened to uh, all of this vibrant activism uh, in the Southwest, in the Midwest, uh, with respect to these uh, very uh, uh, proud and uh, brave uh, organizers, many of them members of the Communist Party. And uh, I subsequently did an article uh, and which became a book chapter, uh, tracing, um, tracing uh, what had happened uh, to these folks. Uh, people like Ralph Guaron from Los Angeles, uh, who introduced the resolution on Mexicans in the National Question in 1948 in New York City at the annual convention of the Communist Party of the United States, which uh, would eventually uh, lead to the uh, founding of a militant organization uh, by the name of the National Association of Mexican Americans, uh, a very uh, pro-communist, internationalist, uh, interracialist uh, organization made up of uh, basically uh, Mexican Americans from Mine Mill and also the fun uh, Furniture Workers of America. And uh, they took some very militant stands uh, in the early uh, Cold War period. Uh, they took a stand, of course, against the war in Korea. They took a stand against uh, nuclear proliferation. Uh, they supported uh, Fidel Castro and the uh, liberation movement in uh, Cuba. They also supported the uh, Puerto Rican uh, independence struggle. And uh, were, were an organization uh, about 3,000 strong that really didn't mince their words uh, or didn't shy away uh, with respect to their commitment uh, to uh, not only civil rights, but the larger issue of of social justice. And of course, they embraced uh, the, uh, the Black Freedom Movement uh, 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 at this time. And uh, their claim to fame, of course, was the very uh, famous strike in 1953, uh, realized uh, for us as the uh, salt of the earth strike. Uh, this very uh, militant struggle by a hundred uh, mine workers and their families uh, in southern uh, New Mexico. Uh, and then the purges came, and uh, a lot of these individuals found themselves uh, victims. Uh, victims like uh, Anna Correa Berry of Denver, Colorado, a member of the United Packing House Workers of America, tried under the Smith Act, a uh, case that went uh, to the Supreme Court. Uh, Anna Correa Berry wasn't uh, exonerated until uh, 1964. Uh, Refugio Martinez, a uh, member of the Packing House Workers of America, there in Chicago, uh, had joined the Communist Party in 1932, uh, reported in, uh, in, in 1948. Uh, Roberto Galvan out of San Diego uh, with the United Packing House Workers of America, which would become the, uh, the Food and Tobacco Workers uh, Union, uh, fighting the Klan along the uh, border uh, in the Imperial Valley, uh, and eventually becoming victimized prime uh, suspect, a prime uh, victim of attack uh, by, by the Klan. Uh, the Klan uh, had a tendency of using blow torches uh, and uh, gutting uh, Mexican nationals that they caught uh, there in the desert uh, uh, in southern uh, Colorado. But uh, Galvan stood up to the Klan, uh, but he also faced uh, deportation. Uh, his uh, son had fought in World War II. He'd been a resident of the United States for over 30 years. But uh, he, uh, of course, was victimized for attending uh, left-led uh, 
organizational meetings uh, in uh, the 1930s. Uh, another part of the story, I'm sure most of you probably know about uh, Reyes Lopez Tejerina and the land grants movement uh, out of New Mexico, uh, an organization that was formed in 1963, and uh, the shootouts and uh, the issues, uh, very combative issues in northern New Mexico, uh, revolving around the stealing of lands in New Mexico uh, by way of an international treaty, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Uh, well, Reyes uh, was a Baptist minister, a Pentecostal minister from Laredo, Texas. And uh, he uh, and his family were taken out. Uh, his grandfather was lynched uh, in, uh, in, in South Texas. Uh, there was a, a I'm going to talk about this in a minute. Uh, they brought out the Tejerina family. Uh, his grandpa had done something wrong, and they lynched him. And uh, the, all the family was, uh, was privy to this. They, they witnessed uh, Grandpa Tejerina being lynched. Uh, Tejerina's father had done some bad things, uh, if you will, as a farm worker. So the uh, farm owner, uh, what he did, he, he cut Tejerina's uh, dad's Achilles tendons, the hobbled uh, And uh, these were some of the practices uh, that we found in South Texas that Tejerina had seen. And of course, uh, there was some talk here about memory uh, this morning. And these were the memories that Tejerina took to New Mexico. And uh, Tejerina had a vision. Uh, he was living in California in a cave, and it all came to him, just like this all came to me about three years ago. He had an epiphany. And uh, he was told by God that uh, he was going to lead uh, the people of New Mexico uh, toward justice, toward equality, that he would help them fight uh, the good fight to uh, regain their lands. Well, Tijerina uh, was an interracialist, and uh, he was also a migrant worker, and him and his brother were up in, uh, around Indiana Harbor up north. And uh, I don't know how this happened, but uh, Tijerina was invited by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad of the Nation of Islam. He was a house guest uh, there in Chicago for 10 days. And, uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad School Tijerina about interracial uh, solidarity. Uh, he told them about the evils of the white man. And uh, he told Tijerina that it was extremely important that the Mexican people and the black people should unite together in this fight for social justice. And again, dealing with memory, Tijerina kept this in his mind. And he was one of very few uh, Chicanos, Mexican-Americans, during the 60s, involved in the Poor People's Mar March with Dr. King, but who reached out to uh, African-American uh, members of the freedom struggle and uh, looked at uh, his cause as being a cause uh, that embraced uh, interracial uh, solidarity. I'm also interested in uh, a handful, at least I've identified a handful, of Mexican-Americans who went into the Deep South. Uh, folks like Gene Guerrero, who used to organize through here in the 1960s, uh, from Texas, uh, attended Emory University, and uh, got involved in the union movement here in, uh, in the Carolinas, in North Carolina specifically, in the 1960s. Of course, uh, involved as well in the black freedom struggle. Uh, Elizabeth Sutherland, or Elizabeth Martinez, a graduate of Swarthmore College, class of 1946, went to New York City, uh, worked for Nation Magazine. There was a purge, of course, of left uh, writers. Uh, she, of course, left with, uh, with, with her friends and uh, hooked up with, uh, with SNCC. Uh, the New York office of SNCC uh, eventually made it to Mississippi, wrote about uh, uh, Freedom Summer, 